Oh, we're here. We're here, I hope. I hope. Can you hear me? Oh, my word. The computer did an update, and then the Wi-Fi just cut out right when I was about to start talking. So luckily, I think we're here. I apologize for that. We're a couple of minutes late. It has been, what a day of, of, uh, of news. Uh, in fact, some just tragic, heartbreaking, um, breaking news that I want to get to in a moment that doesn't really deal with this uh, case, but I do want to take a minute to talk about it. Um, and I just want to thank you for being here tonight. It is a big day tomorrow. We are on the eve of trial. I mean, I guess jury selection could technically be considered part of the trial, but we have a jury and tomorrow it is, uh, it's go time as my graphic here says. Thank you for being here. Please let me know where you're watching from. And if you have any questions, happy to answer as many of those tonight as I can as we get ready for this trial. I'm Nate Eaton. This is Courtroom Insider. We are in Boise, Idaho for the next, I don't know, eight to 10 weeks. We'll see how long this trial goes, answering your questions and uh, bringing you complete coverage from the courtroom. If you cannot watch or be there every day, I'm happy to fill you in every night. Before we get to the trial, uh, another story I've been covering for the past almost two years now, major development today. Uh, the body of Dylan Rounds was found in Lucin, Utah. Dylan vanished over Memorial Day back in May of 2022. I remember that weekend. I remember on Monday getting so many messages from his family and friends saying, can you please do a story? And we did one on East Idaho News. I've interviewed his mom, Candace, and his father, Justin, several times. And um, they found his body today. And it's just so sad. But such a relief, on the other hand, for this family. Dylan was farming out in the desert of Utah, northern Utah. Like, really, when I say the desert, it's the desert near the Nevada-Utah border uh, a man named Jen, James Brenner is accused of killing him. And from what the family tells me, Brenner led the authorities to Dylan's body as part of a plea agreement. So um, it sounds like the, the case won't be going to trial. I don't know many of the details about that pub, that I can publicly share, but the case won't be going to trial. But at least they have Dylan. And, you know, I was... Um, talking to Dylan's mom earlier today, and of course they just need a little bit of space, but they thank everybody for their, for your prayers and for your thoughts. And Dylan is on the way home. The the um, medical examiners, of course, will do the uh, report and try to officially 100% identify him. But it sounds like that's it sounds like it's him, and that's um, all we know for that. So tonight, Candace and Justin and all your family thinking about you, praying for you. What a kid, and. Um, we all honor him as we uh, think about his life and glad that you have this answer to the big question of where has he been. All right, moving on um, to the, the Daybell trial. As I mentioned, tomorrow is a big day. Tonight, we're going to talk about a couple of things like the gag order that Judge Boyce issued. It was extended. And when I say extended, I don't just mean extended in like the time but also the scope. More people are under this gag order. Non-dissemination order is another word for it. We're going to talk about what will happen tomorrow. Also, we'll look back at the opening statements in Lori Vallow's trial one year ago uh, and compare. Well, not compare because we don't know what's going to happen tomorrow, but I want you to hear them. Not the whole, all of them. I pulled out some clips and you can hear just what was said. And then tomorrow, as you listen, as we all listen to what the opening statements are in Chad Daybell's trial, see if there's some similarities. I imagine there would be, but they could do a complete 180 and do a whole new opening statement. Different trial, different jurors. However, you could argue that these jurors never heard the first opening argument. So stick with the same. I don't know. We'll see. We'll also talk about possible witnesses that could be called during the trial. The witness list is sealed. We don't know exactly who they will be, but we kind of have an idea because of Lori's trial. And we will remember JJ, Tylee, and Tammy, of course, the victims in this. So, <laughs> little jolt there. Uh, I also want to answer your question so you can let me know where you're watching from. Okay, let's talk about this gag order. I want to pull it up. So a gag order basically prohibits you, if a gag order is issued on you, um, you can't talk, you can't really speak about it, or you're violating a court order. You may recall that 
last week, or actually it was right before jury selection, John Pryor, Chad Daybell's attorney, did an interview with a TV station in Boise. He talked about the case. He talked about whether Lori Vallow might be called as a witness. Um, and immediately the prosecution raised a red flag to the judge saying, judge, we're trying to convene a jury here and have a fair trial. And you have the attorney for the defense out doing a media interview. So the judge slapped a gag order on the attorneys associated with the case and said, you can't talk about it till after jury selection and opening statements. Well, that would have been tomorrow. The prosecutors on Monday at, after the jury was picked asked the judge if he would extend the gag order until the end of the trial. And the defense agreed. John Pryor agreed. And so this afternoon around 2.45, the judge issued his order. And I want to read it through to you on March 28. The court issued a non-dissemination order to address concerns by counsel about media coverage. That order contained, uh, contained a term that it would be in effect until after opening statements or until April 15th. On April 8th, in a hearing allowed by the court, counsel for both the state and the defense argued that the order should be extended through the duration of the trial. Um, the parties concurred that extending the order would benefit the administration of a fair trial given continued concerns about media coverage. The court notes that, that the trial is both open to the public and media for observation as well as being broadcast to the public. In addition to ongoing concern raised by the attorneys of continuing media requests for comments and interviews, uh, the court has now confirmed a media member likewise contacted the essential court staff directly involved in the case in an effort to gain information beyond what is appropriate in the public purview. Okay, then he goes on to say the court has uh, issued with no objections the non-dissemination. So here's where it's different now. The attorneys for any interested party or any attorney who has previously resented, pre represented any party in the case, like Mark Means um, or like John Thomas, Jim Archibald, including the prosecuting attorney, defense attorney, and any attorney representing a witness, victim, victim's family, as well as the parties to the above, including but not limited to investigators, law enforcement personnel, and agents for the prosecuting attorney or defense attorney, and essential court staff directly involved in the case are prohibited from making extra ju judicial statements, written or oral, concerning this case between March 28th and the conclusion of the trial. This order specifically prohibits any statement which a reasonable person would expect to be disseminated by means of public communication that relates to the following. Evidence, character, credibility, reputation, any opinion as the merits, um, any information a lawyer would know, and it goes on to say that. And then it says, if it's further ordered that no individual covered by this order shall avoid its prescriptions by actions directly or indirectly that result in violating it, should improper media intrusion, intrusion occur, conflicting with the order, let the court know. That's a lot to read. You can go read it all. Uh, these these type of orders are, are, from what I understand, somewhat common in high-profile cases. This one might be a little bit broad, but normally most people aren't going to talk during the trial. And it's understandable. They, you know, are focused on the trial. And prosecutors usually don't talk until after the trial. And so that's, you know, I hope that one day they haven't done any on-camera interviews or anything. I hope that they would do that, along with John Pryor and Chad Daybell, if he wants to, anybody associated with the case. So that gag order is in effect. Um, I know a lot of you have been asking my thoughts on it. You know, it's understandable. Um, and I'll, I'll probably have more to say, I guess, about it at the end of the trial. Um, is As reporters, we try to find out information from every source we can. Um, and uh, some reporters, that, that's different as far as like ethical type of, of things. And, and I've been guilty in my career of approaching people that I shouldn't have probably approached, but I didn't know any different. I'm not going to go to Judge Boyce's house and be like, hey, Judge, can we talk about the case or the prosecutors for that matter or, you know, John Pryor, unless we, you know, have an existing relationship. I've never spoken to Judge Boyce, I don't think in my life. I think one time in the courtroom, he, after a trial was over, I was sitting down with my back toward, and he walked in and he thought I was someone else and said hello, but but that's it. Um, so, yeah, that I, I mean, it is what it is. Hopefully, you know that there are there there will be other other things that come up this you know won't hopefully be an issue or we'd hate for the judge to crack down on media even more so so that is what the gag order pertains that's what it means um you may recall that a gag order was issued in the Koberger case 
early on and the media, we actually fought it. We thought it was too broad, uh, hired an attorney saying that you can't, I, I believe that that gag order was for everybody associated to the case, like family members and whatnot. Well, is the is a family member within the jurisdiction of the court? That was the question. The judge can tell the attorneys that he's they're under his purview for sure. Um, and then the attorneys, the people that get subpoenaed to come and testify, their subpoenas say don't talk to the media. But can you really tell, you know, the aunt of someone not to talk? That's that's the legal question. And it's beyond me because I am not an attorney. Okay, so here's what we can expect tomorrow. We will have the jurors file in. They will be given new numbers in the case, 1 through 18. They will take their seats. They will be sworn in. They will be read the charges. They will be read the um, instructions, a lot of instructions. They, they will just be given, basically, they will be told what their um, life will be like for the next 8 to 10 weeks. Uh, once that happens, that could take about an hour. That can take some time. So court is scheduled to begin at 830. Again, we're going to have it live. Tune into the East Idaho News YouTube channel or our Facebook around 8 to 815. We'll start the live stream. It'll just be a standby graphic, but at least if you're logged on, you can know. And be sure that you subscribe. Every time I hit a button, it does that. So I should probably shouldn't hit any other buttons. I'm going to call Jordan, my tech guy. He's here. Jordan's here in town. He'll be at the courthouse tomorrow to help do some stuff. Um, anyway, Jordan, if you're watching, something's messed up here. Uh, so that's that's what's going to happen tomorrow. I lost my train of thought. Then the jury, jury will be sworn in, and the prosecutor will give their opening statement in the um, Vallo case. The opening statement for the prosecutor was about 40 minutes. And then the defense will give his opening statement if he wants. He does not have to do it tomorrow. He can wait and do it after the prosecution rests. Now, in Lori Vallow's case, Jim Archibald did the opening statement right away, um, right after the prosecutor. So we'll play a little bit of that in a minute for you. And then right after that, we'll let, what may happen is there'll be a little recess. I'm just predicting because this is what happened in Vallow. Cordell, after the opening statements, which last about hour, hour and a half. So you've got jury instructions. They're sworn in. Then you've got the opening statements for an hour. There'll probably be a break, a short recess. And then we'll come back. And that's when the witnesses will start. And then it will be go. And it'll be the prosecutor's case in the beginning. They will call their witnesses. After they're done, John Pryor will question the witnesses. Then the prosecution will have a chance to follow up on witnesses, and then they'll be dismissed. Prior can object. Prosecutors can object to question he asks. It becomes court, like you've seen on, on television. Um, so that's how it's going to go for the next few weeks. And um, it, should be, it should be interesting. I'm curious to know what your thoughts are. You know, are you, are you predicting it will be similar to Lori's case, or will we have some differences? Um, I think we'll know pretty early on how that's going to be. Okay, I went back to Lori's case and I pulled up the opening statements. And I wanted to play some parts of it just to see how, just to compare how tomorrow's are going to be. Pay attention because think in your mind as you're listening to this. We don't have video because there wasn't video allowed last year. It was just audio. Could this opening statement be given in Chad's trial tomorrow? Remember, last year they really had just had to focus on Lori. Chad was mentioned a lot. Alex Cox was mentioned a lot. But this was to persuade them last year that Lori was guilty. Tomorrow it's to persuade them that Chad is guilty and for the defense to, to, to poke holes in those arguments. So here is Lindsay Blake giving the opening statement. I'm going to play one part. It's a little longer, I think about eight, nine minutes. Then I'll come back and then I want to play you the, the closing remarks of what she said. I'm not playing you the whole thing. We have that on our YouTube if you want to listen. But listen to this part. Money, power, and sex. That's what this case is about. The defendant, Lori Vallow Daybell, used money, power, and sex or the promise of those things to get what she wanted. What she wanted was money, power, and sex. It didn't matter 
what obstacles she had to remove to get what she wanted. It didn't matter if the obstacle was a thing or a person. And if it was a person, it didn't matter who. Tylee Ryan was a vibrant young woman, 17 years old, a whole life ahead of her. She was just about to enter into adulthood and make her own way in the world. Who knows what she would have become. Tylee had already lost her father and she received social security benefits because of that. Tylee had money, Lori wanted it, Tylee's gone. Joshua Jackson Vallow, lovingly known by friends and family as JJ, was a seven-year-old vibrant, happy-go-lucky little boy. He had most of his childhood and his whole life ahead of him. But JJ was, was tough, he's, he's a seven-year-old. He took a lot of time and effort and energy to care for. That time, effort, and energy took away from the defendant doing what she wanted to do and from the defendant being with Chad Daybell and devoting her time and attention to him. JJ had also lost his father. And when JJ lost his father, he became even that much more difficult to care for, no longer a second parent to help. Not only that, JJ also was entitled to social security benefits. The defendant didn't want to have to take care of JJ anymore. She wanted the money. JJ's gone. Tamara Douglas Daybell, known by friends and family as Tammy, a 49-year-old mother of five, a grandmother, a computer whiz by all accounts. She was married to Chad Daybell. The defendant wanted Chad all to herself. Lori wanted those things. Tammy's gone. <clears throat> Tylee was last seen on September 8th of 2019. She had just relocated with her mother to Rexburg, Idaho on or about September 1st of 2019. And seven days later is the last sighting, known sighting of Tylee. The next time Tylee is seen is on June 9th of 2020. She's found buried in a shallow grave on Chad Daybell's property. And when I say she's found, what I mean is what was left of Tylee was found. Charred remains. That's what was left of Tylee. You will hear it described as a mass of bone and tissue. That's what was left of this beautiful young woman, the defendant's daughter. You will also hear how Tylee's DNA was recovered on a pickaxe pick and shovel <coughs> located in a shed on defendant Daybell's property. JJ was last seen on September 22nd of 2019 at the defendant's apartment in Rexburg, Idaho. Last time JJ was seen, he was with his uncle, Alex Cox, the defendant's brother. You'll hear from a witness that he saw Alex Cox carrying JJ. JJ's head on his shoulder appeared to be a peaceful scene. It appeared JJ was sleeping at that time. JJ was not seen again until June 9th of 2020, when he was also found in a shallow grave on the defendant's property. JJ was found wrapped in garbage bags with duct tape around him. He had duct tape around his head. He had duct tape around his arms, taping them into a position like this. That's how the defendant's little boy was found. You will hear what a difficult scene that was to process. Law enforcement had been searching for these children since November of 2019. And even the most veteran law enforcement officers you'll hear from were disturbed by the scene. Some may have still been holding out hope against all odds that we'd find these children alive, but this wasn't what they expected to find. Tammy was last seen alive on the night of October 18th of 2019. Her son left to work. She was home alone with Chad Daybell 
on that night. On the morning of October 19th, just before 6 a.m., a 911 call is placed. Tammy's dead. She's cold and she's stiff. What we know is by the time law enforcement showed up, Chad Daybell had moved her body. Chad Daybell gives a description that Tammy wasn't feeling well, she'd been sick. Very few other witnesses report any concerns about Tammy's health. And mind you, at the time law enforcement show up at Tammy's death, when it's been reported, it's unknown at that time about JJ and Tylee missing. It's unknown that Lori Vallow and Chad Daybell are in any kind of a relationship. So nothing about Tammy's death is initially deemed to be suspicious. You will hear that the defendant was in Hawaii at the time Tammy died. And you will also hear that less than three weeks later, 17 days to be exact, the defendant and Chad Daybell were back in Hawaii. They were getting married on a sunny beach in Hawaii, dancing and celebrating their life together, while Tylee and JJ were cold in the ground in shallow graves, and while Tammy had just barely been laid to rest in the Springville, Utah Cemetery, her hometown. The missing children, the sudden death of Tammy, the quick marriage of Chad and the defendant, left so many questions for those still grieving the loss of Tammy and those still wondering 24-7 about the whereabouts and safety of the children. You will also hear how the defendant had switched Tylee's money from Tylee's J.P. Morgan Okay, I'm going to pause this for a minute because so many of you are asking about the BB clicking, BBA the typing. On That's not me. August 16th I'm going to pause this, though. Um, that's on the original court recording. I'm not typing. <laughs> so, so many of you are like, Nate, stop typing. I'm not. I was that day. And what happened that day is after opening statement, you had all of the reporters on the, in the courtroom with our laptops out. We had a row of like eight of them and we were all typing frantically because remember there were no cameras. And after the opening statements, they spread us out throughout the courtroom. So I moved to the other side. We were spread out so that the microphones didn't pick up the typing. Uh, but yeah, you can tell it was a very loud click, 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 click. So I apologize. It's not me now, but so many of you are addressing. I had to come on and I wanted to, uh, you know, talk about it with you. And and anyway, you can go on and listen to the remainder of the um, opening statement on our YouTube. But I did want to play the end for you with Lindsay Blake. So she goes on to talk about basically lay her case. Now, remember that you all we all know a ton about the case. These guys knew nothing. So they've got to start at a really base level of why are we here and who are all these people and how do we connect them all? Because there's a lot of people, a lot of places. It's just um, it's just crazy. So um, this is how the Lindsay Blake ends her opening statement. Remember, she's got to make a mark. She's they they already know in their head that money, power, sex, those are the things. And then this is how she ends it uh, before she sits down and Jim Archibald stands up. Mind you, and circling back, when Tylee was found, as we talked about, all that was found was, ch was charred remains. Tylee's hands are gone. When JJ was found, his hands were bound and duct taped in front of his body. When Tammy was found, those hands, she was described as a computer whiz, never going to do anything on a computer again. And the defendant and Chad Daybell getting married on a beach in Hawaii, starting their life together, all obstacles gone. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, I thank you for being here today and your willingness to serve on the jury. We recognize that you do have a task here and you are the judge of facts. And I would let you know that that is the most important job in this courtroom. This is set to be a long trial and you're going to sit through a lot of evidence and a lot of testimony. What we ask you to do is be attentive to the testimony and evidence presented.
apply your common sense and reasonableness in weighing the evidence. Give every piece of evidence and testimony the weight you think it is due. Hold us to our burden, and we feel that if you apply your reason and common sense, I'm confident that you will return a verdict of guilty in this case. Thank you. And with that, she sat down. Now, um, I do want to say that I remember when she was talking about their hands, JJ's hands being bound, Tylee's hands, and Chad and Lori getting married on the beach. They showed on the projector screen JJ's hands bound. They showed Tylee, well, her hands weren't bound. They showed what was left of her after they had graphically described it and shown some autopsy photos. And then they showed Tammy Daybell's autopsy photo and then they cut to a photo of chad and Lori on the beach smiling and laughing and their ring fingers they showed those hands so again you're telling a story they're telling the story they're they're trying to say things that are memorable and and effective and that's when um judge boy said to the defense in Lori's case would you like to say anything would you like to give your opening statement and jim archibald said yes at this time we do I have heard other uh, opening statements by Jim Archibald that are not quite like this, I think because this case was so unique, but I want to play you a little bit of what he said. And again, listen and compare tomorrow when John Pryor gets up to give his opening statement and see if there's any similarities. I also thank you for your service. Uh, this is a difficult case case we have not been able to settle without you, without you. And that's why you've been called here to help us settle this case. Uh, the court will allow a brief introduction. I know a lot about you with your 12 page or 20 page questionnaires. And so I'd, I'd like to just make a brief introduction of uh, the defense. Uh, I've been an attorney uh, since 1991. I've been both a private attorney and a public defender. And in small county Idaho, there's a lot of us lawyers who do both uh, public defense work and private work. And so uh, over the past 32 years, uh, I've, I've done a, a bit of both. I've, I've been assigned to uh, and they're difficult, they're difficult cases. Uh, I was assigned to this case. Uh, I'm paid by the taxpayers, and so thank you for paying your taxes. Practice where I, I do a little bit of everything, and, uh, and then I, I get about one of these difficult cases a year assigned to me, and, and we do what? what we can. What does a defense lawyer do? Uh, we make sure that our client's constitutional rights are protected. We make sure that the government does its job. We make sure that proof beyond a reasonable doubt is in place before there's a, uh, before there's a decision. So, so with these difficult cases, we resolve 99% of our cases. Less than 1% of cases actually make it to trial. And so we, I believe the state and the defense, uh, we generally do a good job of resolving our disputes. And sometimes when we can't, then we, we call on you to resolve it for us. I'm being assisted in this case uh, by uh, John Thomas. He's a uh, been a, an attorney since 1999. He has also both experience in private law firms and public defenders' offices, uh, where he's handled many, many serious cases. Uh, he's received many accolades for his lawyering, and I appreciate him helping me. Uh, I also am being assisted by Brandon Hobbs. You've probably seen him, and he's an investigator. And so he's, he's helped us investigate this case. Um, 
being a defense lawyer isn't always a popular job. And I, so I appreciate you being respectful towards me, and I'll do the same. I'll be respectful towards you. Some eight years ago, my law office got bombed, and, uh, and so uh, some people are really upset by, by what I do for a living. And so I appreciate you uh, and your ability to decide the facts of this case uh, without uh, emotion overriding your decision. So this case is about Lori Vallow Daybell. Uh, the prosecutor has just told you what the government hopes to prove throughout the next month. Uh, so what's this story about from our defense perspective? And how does this story include you? So the evidence will show that Lori was born and raised in California. She's lived in California, Texas, Arizona, and Hawaii. Uh, she lived in Idaho for less than a month before the event of what you're here to decide. She's one of six children. Uh, her parents are still alive, they're retired. Uh, she's had an older sister and a brother die, and she also has a sister and a brother still living. Uh, she believes in life after death, and she believes she will see her deceased family, including her children, again. She's a beautician by trade. She's worked hard for years in that profession. She's a mother of three, stepmother of two, and is now a grandmother of two children. The evidence will show that people were attracted to her, as the state has told you, have been attracted to her pretty smile, her vivacious personality, her fun-loving, happy-go-lucky personality. People wanted to be around her. Her oldest son is Colby Ryan. He was born in 1996 in Texas. Uh, he's a handsome young man, he currently lives in Arizona. He has two children of his own, making Lori a grandma. Her oldest daughter, Tylee Ryan, was born in 2002 in Texas. She was a ray of sunshine. She had health problems, pancreatitis, a painful and debilitating disease, but Tylee did the best she could. Her marriage to Joe Ryan ended and a painful, long, drawn-out custody battle ensued. And it was hard on all of them. The evidence will show that her next husband, Charles Vallow, was smitten with her and she with him. He had two kids, she had two kids, and the blended family lasted over a decade. Lori was such a, a good, responsible mother to her two children that her husband's sister, Kay Woodcock, wanted her to adopt a special needs toddler newborn. Kay Woodcock was the grandma to a child born in Louisiana in 2012, a child with special needs. The child's parents. I'm going to stop it there and let you go watch the remainder or listen to the remainder if you want. And um, hopefully you can... Uh, get the information you need from that. So th those were the opening statements from a year ago. I'm curious to know your thoughts. Jim, Jim Archibald really didn't present a defense in his opening remarks, as you could hear there. And so it'll be curious to hear if John Pryor actually presents an opening statement as far as you know, we will prove Chad Daybell was not involved. We will make sure that you know, you know, whatever has to be said, or if he'll kind of do a more similar thing. Obviously, Archibald was trying to be relatable to the jurors by saying, you know, I'm here. I've been assigned by the state. It's a tough job. My law office was bombed. Um, you know, that can kind of make you feel sympathy for the man and, and, and the fact that he's there, you know, representing her, a, a woman who... Um, you know, is accused of these hero her horrible, um, horrendous crimes. So that's um, what we'll have tomorrow.
opening statements. Now, I mentioned the witness list being sealed, but I do want to show you last year, every day at the end of the, the trial of each day, I would write in my notebook on the back page who was called as a witness on that particular day. So here is the list that I came up with. You'll have to zoom in and pardon my messy handwriting. Kay Woodcock was witness number one. Notice, by the way, opening statements and the first witness were on April 10th. Tomorrow is April 10th. So the timing, also 10 men and 10 women on each jury. There's some, uh, th some interesting perspectives there. I, do, I, I have um, no idea who the first witness will be tomorrow, but it'll be interesting if it's Kay or she could be further down the line. So Kay Woodcox first, Brandon Boudreaux was second. Then the next day, Ray Hermosillo. He was on the stand the entire day. I remember that day. It was a long day for him. He had to testify the entire day. The next day, it was Jared Wilmore, Joe Powell. Those were deputies, uh, one with Fremont County, then one with Madison. And then the following day, Melanie Gibb and Nathan Duncan, a detective from Arizona. And then the last day of the week, Zulema Pastenis. So you had the first week, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight witnesses. Following Monday, Colby Ryan took the stand. Mark Sari, Chuck Consitas, these are all uh, police officers. Colby's Lori's son, obviously. Uh, Mike Douglas, he's an officer, not Tammy's sis brother, to be sure. Uh, others, we can go down the list. Over on the other side, April Raymond, Nathan Moffat, Josh Wynn Hill, David Warwick, L Melanie Gibbs' boyfriend or husband. Summer Shiflett was on the 25th, Rick Schmidt. So there's 28 witnesses between April 10th and April 25th. Then we go on to the second pages. A lot more um, law enforcement officers. We had the librarian, or not the librarian, the, a, a worker who, a lady who worked with Tammy, and then uh, someone who also um, was Tammy's uh, religious leader in the church, who Chad went over and asked for bail money. Tammy's sister testified on the 27th, that's Samantha Gwillem. Um, and then more up until 59. And I, I, turn, I had to go to the back page of my notebook for number 59. I even started with 60, but we didn't have a 60. Doug Hart with the FBI was the final witness. And he took all of May 5th. So there is the whole list from Lori's trial. Again, there'll probably be more in Chad's, but that kind of gives you an idea of who could be testifying and who, um, you know, might not be. It'll, we'll, we'll have to compare. Okay, I want to show you this beautiful photo of JJ that was sent to me today. <laughs> Look at that. This was JJ running on the golf course when his family first moved to Hawaii. He would take off running so fast. He was also known for running into people's homes because most people there in Hawaii don't lock their doors, but the people would always be so sweet to him. He was fast as can be and truly loved to run. Just a, an adorable baby with a, uh, a toddler, I guess I should say, with a little faux hawk there and his diaper running around. You can just imagine being in Hawaii and being barefoot all the time and loving life. So tonight, you know, on this eve of trial, eve of opening statements, we remember JJ and Tylee and Tammy and wish them justice as the as the next few weeks unfold. I'll be here every night breaking things down for you. I will also be in the courtroom and you can watch tomorrow or I'm going to push this button. Let's see if it works. I hope <laughs> it doesn't work. <laughs> I don't know why. Um, I was going to put up a little graphic that shows how you can follow along because many of you can't watch the trial all day. But after it's done, you can um, watch here at 630 Mountain Time or throughout the day. If you have a break, you can go to eastidahonews.com and read the updates. And also I'm on Twitter, Facebook all of the social media channels that you can uh, find me on. Okay, let me get to some questions. We have a lot of questions. I will try to get to as many as we can, but first some shout outs to the Northwest. I don't know who Northwest is, but hi, Northwest. Uh, Cheryl F., Jacqueline, Lori P., Lisa Klingler, Ruth Vork, and Lisa Klein, Angie Erickson, Mary Hines, Debbie Hall from Australia, Mary Monson, DSB, and Mana, or sorry, Mona Morin from Canada. Also today, I went to In-N-Out in Meridian. We don't have In-N-Out in Eastern Idaho. And the one in Meridian is 
always busy from what I understand. I tried to go the other day and it was so packed. They had lines of cars. I didn't even bother. But today I actually went and I went inside and I ordered and I went and sat down at the one (laughs) empty table. And as I was sitting there, a woman comes up and I'm sorry, ma'am, if you're watching, I don't remember your name. And she shows me her phone and it's a picture of me. And I'm like, I know that guy. (laughs) She's like, I watch you every night on my TV. And here you are. So, ma'am, thank you for saying hello. It's good to to fill uh, a little bit of home, I guess you could say, even though I'm not in my hometown, in my home city. It was good to meet you. And I got a burger, just a hamburger, no onion, and some of those fries and a drink. And I know there's the big controversy of is in and out really worth it? I like it and it's cheap. It's it's a, it's not expensive. So that's why I like it. Okay, here's some of your questions. Lisa, who made these cases separate? Good question, Lisa. The cases were together up until last spring, about three or four weeks before Lori Vallow's trial. The problem was because Lori Vallow was a death penalty case, was a death penalty case, you have to hire a mitigation specialist to really dig into the client, to really dig into Lori, go through all of her history, interview all of her family, try to find every single thing you can on her to try to spare her life. Lori refused to waive her right to a speedy trial. And DNA evidence came in at the last minute from the prosecutors. So her attorneys argued, one, we don't have time to get this DNA, to go through this DNA evidence. There's so much evidence already. Two, our mitigation specialist does not have time to complete her report. And three, Lori Vallow is not waiving her right to a speedy trial. If she had waived her right to a speedy trial, the trials could have stayed together and they could have been held together. But because she refused, the judge, his hands were kind of tied. So he said, okay, we're going to go forward with her trial but we're going to take death penalty off the table. So we'll remove that mitigation issue. And as far as um, the, the uh, prosecution, they wanted to kind of keep them together, but they didn't have a choice because that's what the judge said. Chad waived his right to a speedy trial. That's why Chad has been in jail for four years, almost sitting in the same jail at most, most, Uh, inmates, I almost said clients, most inmates stay at most a year in the county jail. So because he waived his right, she didn't. The judges separated the cases and here we are. Here we are. Um, Gives us more to talk about, I guess. Uh, Jane, when they show evidence, are they covering the cameras? I believe some evidence you'll see, but the graphic stuff, you won't. There will be some things that are just spoken. And um, honestly, the camera um, quality is not the best. So even if you can see the screen, most of the time, the evidence is shown on the screen. Uh, They don't pull out like a DNA swab or something. They did pull out a gun last time, a gun that Alex Cox had, and they showed it to the jury. It was a, a big gun. But I think that's the only like physical evidence I recall them showing. The rest of it is photographs. So, um, I think you'll see some photos, but, but probably not a lot. Why is no one up? Ramey asks, why is no one bringing up domestic violence? Please shine a light onto that. Um, well, I'm not quite sure what you mean, Ramey. The, I don't know if you mean domestic violence in Chad's marriage, because I haven't seen any evidence of that uh, or heard about that. Or in Lori Vallow's marriage with Charles Vallow, I, again, I haven't heard any reports that he attacked her. Or maybe she at- attacked him. I, I don't know. But domestic violence is not a laughing matter. And, of course, it should be talked about. And um, if you need help, there are resources available. But, Remy, I'm not and, – and you can find those. Google them. I'm, I'm not quite sure what you mean as far as in relation to this case. Tammy asks, who called whom on the day they found the kids? Did Lori call Chad? I believe, shoot, I think she did call him. I don't remember who called who. It all blurs together. I know he was in the driveway. He spoke to their attorney. I'm sure you all know who called who. But um, I thought then maybe she called him back. Um, I'll have to go. I'll, I'll have to go check on that. I'm sorry. I don't have your answer. Um, okay. A couple more questions. 
Is Miss Blake reading her opening or is it memorized? Valerie asks. She memorized some of it and then she went down to her paper. Rob Wood, in his closing, I don't believe he had a paper. I think he just went off the top of his head. Um, okay, I think that's it. Is that it? That must be it for the questions. Thank you. Uh, there were there was a couple of others as far as the Church of the Firstborn. Renee said, can Chad and Lori communicate with each other through email, phone calls, or letters? Um, no, I don't know. I, I, I mean, there might be a way, but they're not. And I think after this trial and after her in Arizona, that trial, uh, everything's read anyway. So, you know, if there's anything privileged in there, then that would be that would be taken care of by the police. They would read it. But they're they're not communicating. And as far as the church of the firstborn, um, I don't I don't think that that's continued. I don't think he's preaching. I don't think he's doing um, I don't think he's doing any of that. I, I perhaps, but from everything I heard and in, in when he was in the Fremont County jail, he stuck to himself. I don't know if the fellow inmates in Ada County are going to want to listen to Chad Daybell every day. Okay. I'm being told by Peggy. I have 15 more questions. I am at a, a law. Okay. Found them. Thank you. Oh yes. Okay. Here's one I want to address. Nate, is it true you interviewed Julie Rowe and she told you the kids were dead and Chad did it, but you never released the interview? Why, if that's the case? Julie Rowe worked with Chad Daybell. He published her books. She has a little bit of a following or did. Julie Rowe, after this case broke, sent out a news release saying she was open to do interviews about it. Um, I never interviewed her in the beginning and then she came to eastern idaho and came to our newsroom and and asked to sit down with me and so i did i did sit down with her in our studio we spoke for about an hour i then had to leave um and that was on a friday then the following tuesday the children were found and everything that she said was no longer relevant as far as in relation to the case she i don't know if she if she has publicly said that she told me she knew the kids were dead and Chad did it. I that she did not say that. I have the interview and I'll go back and watch the interview. And I don't know if I, I, she didn't say that. I believe what she said was the kids are safe or the kids are fine. Um, so anyway, that that's I. She did not. We did do an interview. We didn't release it because it was two days later. We were gonna hold. We thought well maybe we'll do the interview and hold it for a documentary. By the way, I've interviewed several other people in the connection to this case that we haven't released the interview. We've taken quotes from or portions of it, but it comes down to the news value. Does the news value of of it does this add value to the story or not? And how does it? And we could publish a story every single day about this case, but does it really add news value? Hope that makes sense. Several viewers have asked, there was a potential juror the other day who had an NFL draft ticket for this month. Was he let go? I think he was. Let me look. I have the list here. Uh, just started our Arkansas family. Um, yeah, he was let go. So he can go to the draft. That was a memorable one. He said that he, I believe he was from Detroit. And for the first time ever, he had tickets to the NFL draft. He's been waiting his entire life to go to the draft. And this trial is right in the middle of it. Um, I just want to be double sure that I have this. Draft. Um, yeah, he, he is not on the jury so he gets to go to the draft that's great he did he did create he did create a laugh about about that um you know when he said that he wanted to go to the draft and there was another woman that had a a trip planned to europe that she had paid for she um she was let go so yeah he he won't be on the jury um what were your emotions sitting 10 feet in front of chad Oh, um, it was a little odd. I mean, it was a little weird. I, we, 
we've seen each other in court all the time. At least I see him. I don't know if he's seen me. I'm sure he has. But we, he, normally it's the back of his head. But we've never been face to face other than in Hawaii. I'm sure he knows who I am. Um, you know, there's a, a couple questions I'd love to ask him if the time ever comes. But I, 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 I didn't really have much much emotions. I just it was just kind of odd to see him there. Uh, you know, this person that that has consumed a lot of our lives for the past four years sitting there. Um, what did Chad and Lori get a divorce? No, they didn't. Um, Amanda, if Chad's found guilty and gets the death penalty, would it apply to all of his charges? For instance, can he get life in prison on some charges and death for the others? He can only get death on the first degree murder charges. So he would get death on those and then they would impose a sentence on the others. The conspiracy, he could get life in prison. The insurance fraud, no way could you get death, death. So he might get like 10 years for that. And then the judge could say they all run together concurrently or they run consecutively one after the other. Um, but obviously we know that the death or the life in prison, that'll be the one at the top, you know, that everybody knows. Um, so, yeah, I hope that answers your question. And then we have uh, Jolene. I'm watching from Australia. Do you know if there will be a funeral for JJ or Tylee? I believe that there will be a memorial service, and once we have information to report on that, I'll let you know, and hopefully we can live stream that for all of you to watch all over the world. Um, if the judge is worried about jurors hearing info on the case, why are they not sequestered during the whole trial and only for deliberation? Well, some that's happened to some juries, but it's very hard to sequester a jury for eight to ten weeks, and and the judge made that point. It's not only hard, but it's expensive, and so he felt that you know, it's best to, to, to not sequester them during the trial. There weren't issues during Lori's trial. So hopefully there won't be during this trial and they'll be able to go and come in peace and they'll have security to be with them. And, and that's, um, that's why he did it. But when, once they reach a verdict, if it's guilty, they then will have to be sequestered as they, um, deliberate and come up with the sentence. Okay. I think that's it. I think we got it all. Well, we didn't get them all. There's a lot of questions, but I'm going to stop there. We've been going about an hour. Sorry about the tech problems. Uh, it was a little frazzled tonight with the Dylan Rounds news. And, you know, it's 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 a good good closure. But again, we're, we're thinking of him and Candace and Justin and all the family tonight. We just wish you all the best. And tomorrow, the, the whole thing kicks off. So join us tomorrow morning, if you can, for the live stream. I'll do a live report probably after court ends around 3.30 Mountain Time from the courthouse. So stay tuned for that. And then tomorrow we'll break it all down. I'll be here. I know you'll have a lot of questions. I'm happy to answer them. I just can't thank you enough for supporting us, for following us, and for trusting us with the news as uh, it continues to unfold over the next few weeks. Have a good night. See you tomorrow.